Greetings from Madrid. I'm very happy to be joining our virtual community of the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice to introduce our speaker, Deborah Cowan. Deborah Cowan is a professor in the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto. They are the author of Military Workfare, The Soldier and Social Citizenship in Canada, 2008, and The Deadly Life of Logistics, Mapping Violence in Global Trade, 2014, which was the book that introduced me, a non-geographer, um, to their extraordinary work. Um, and I'm super excited to learn more about with you all today um, and beyond. Cowan also co-edited the volumes War, Citizenship, Territory with Emily Gilbert and Digital Life in the Global City, Contesting Infrastructures with Alexis Mitchell, Emily Pardis, and Brett Story, and Toronto's Inner Suburbs with Vanessa Parlett. And they're one of the co-editors with Catherine McKittrick and Simone Brown of an exciting book series out of Duke, Erin Trees, that I highly recommend along with everything else I've just named. Um, to check out um, what's been published in that series so far. And their current research is entitled, uh, and I love this title, uh, Spineless Infrastructure for the Apocalypse. So I think it's evident from this um, quick summary that Cowan is a profoundly interdisciplinary and collaborative scholar uh, whose work is both uh, academic and public facing. And its work engaged deeply with racial capitalism, imperialism, and settler colonialism in and beyond North America, uh, and the dense entanglements of military and corporate infrastructures. But it's also, and this is one of the things that I find um, so compelling, um, and what I found so compelling about the deadly life of logistics when I first read it, it's also deeply engaged with points or nodes where the logistics of injustice have to reckon with others. Uh, especially, although not exclusively people, um, whether as workers, citizens, artists, activists, or in any number of other overlapping roles they may inhabit, um, who step in and step up to reveal and disrupt what wants to be a seamless flow. So um, it's a project, or these are projects of both uncovering and showing the violences of logistics, how they work with us and through us for unjust ends and with unjust means, but also, and I think, and equally important and in the spirit of the Havens Right Center, uh, the centrality of resistance. And I hope, I think that we probably, or those of us on, in this meeting agree that we need both um, careful accounting of the violence and also careful study of the alternatives to it. And um, for those of us invested in, interested in infrastructures and the global and the planetary in labor and labor struggle and queer theory, and anti-racist thought and practice, um, their work is extraordinarily generative. So as um, Adrienne said, their talk today um, entitled Logistics of Life and Death, COVID, Climate, Coloniality promises to expand on this rich body of work. And I'd like to welcome them and thank you all for being here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I'm just gonna put up my slides. Um, so thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Adrian, um, Jaina, and Peter for um, both inviting me and, and uh, dealing with all the kind of background, backroom logistics and the lovely conversation um, before we open today. Um, it's a real honor to be here and it's a well to be to be here and there. And it's um, an especial honor to be part of such a beautiful series. So if you haven't if you're here for this talk and you haven't checked out the rest of the series, uh, I know that the videos will be posted and there's more talks to come as we heard, really worth checking out. Um, I'm speaking today from Treaty 13 territory or the Dish With One Spoon territory, which is the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the treaty territories of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. And I um, also wanna thank uh, my multi-generational household in these uh, times of online work, it's impossible to get anything done without their <laughs> amazing support and silence <laughs> at times. Um, and I also uh, should thank my 12 teaching assistants who are currently grading our 800 student exam <laughs> so that I could be here. Um, your work is so deeply valued. You've been amazing all term. So if any of you are listening, thank you. Um, so uh, today what I want to do, and, and Sarah, thank you for that incredibly generous introduction, which um, is humbling, but I, is uh, helpful also because I do want to kind of speak today across some of my older and newer work. Um, I think that the kind of cascading crises that have 
been certainly um, in my mind are also very much in the world. And so in order to kind of do some justice to what we're seeing around us, um, I'm gonna kind of move around a bit uh, across um, different parts of, of research I've done, different projects I'm invested in, including some newer work. But I wanted to start here. I really couldn't resist um, starting uh, with the extraordinary and inspiring um, victories of the Amazon Labor Union. Against all odds and predictions, a uh, grassroots organizing effort won their recent unionization drive against one of the largest corporations in the world and their very aggressive union busting tactics. So this victory you know, has been reported around the world and, and celebrated among many of us. Um, but I wanna suggest that it's not only important because of the size of the corporation, um, but because of Amazon's essential role in the logistical economy. So Amazon um, is a logistics company, not just a retailer, not just an online retailer, and they specialize in coordinating movement. Amazon has um, over 850 facilities in 22 countries occupying 220 million square feet. They also have the largest private or commercial satellite system, second only to the Pentagon. Um, and since 2015, they've been providing fulfillment services um, for themselves, but also for increasingly for other companies and competing with rather than relying on industry giants like UPS and FedEx. So from panics over toilet paper and the hoarding of essentials in the early spring of 2020 to concerns about shutdowns in China, creating disruption to supply for Western consumption to the geopolitical crisis of PPE to the ongoing logistics of vaccine apartheid and more recently um, to so-called truckers occupations and blockades pandemic pedagogy has involved mass education about some basic tenets of supply chain capitalism. Labor, hey, scholar, you labor scholar um, Kim Moody oh, suggests oh. that, quote, the pandemic has graphically demonstrated the centrality of the human networks that keep the global supply oh, chains moving. Box, that is, all those who produce the goods and those who bring them to the factory, the hospital, the supermarket, or your self-isolating home. So it was fear regarding disruptions to supply that led to the designation of the essential worker that seemed to briefly offer an opening, the possibility for the valorization of hyper-exploited precarious workers of color. Instead, what we've increasingly come to see um, has been corporate PR stunts performing gratitude to essential workers while refusing meaningful shifts in financial compensation, sick leave, or even access to PPE. It's not an accident that Jeff Bezos, the world's first trillionaire, was the CEO of Amazon. He and others like him have gra grabbed even more wealth through the pandemic, largely through the hyper exploitation of that category of worker, further indexing the significance of the explosion of labor actions and organizing in this sector. So well before COVID-19, Anna Singh had already diagnosed the arrival of supply chain capitalism and a burgeoning critical literature was investigating the geopolitical economies and ecologies of logistics. Supply chain capitalism is organized as a dis dispersed but coordinated set of material and information systems where commodities are manufactured across vast distances, multiple national borders, and complex social and technological infrastructures. Production sim hasn't simply been moved further away from consumption. Production itself has been disaggregated into component parts and distributed into complex geographical arrangements. The supply chain supersedes the factory and as such, the factory is now stretched across transnational corridors, seams, uh, nodes. The system has become inc incredibly and extremely vulnerable to disruption. But the problem of logistics and disruption also runs much deeper in this moment. Circulation struggles are key, but the implications of the rise of logistics are much wider and deeper than just disrupting capitalist circulation. Today, I wanna to suggest that at stake is not just the speed of trade, but necropolitical motion, not just corporate power, but imperial infrastructure, and not just the movement of stuff, but the making of logistical life and ecologies. In other words, the analysis needs to be expanded to better appreciate the stakes of this logistical regime of motion and to better apprehend the significance of uh, the Amazon labor union organizing and its connections with seemingly disparate struggles over coloniality, climate, and COVID. In other words, we need a different engagement with logistics that maps it as a field of struggle over imperialism, slavery, and slaughter. We need to situate these maps within a politics of racial capitalist and settler colonial motion and reproduction. <laughs> 
So the power of logistics lies not just in matters of physical distribution, but also in the production of life in imperial motion. Logistics has long been about making live and die by making and containing motion. Logistics has its ancient genesis as an art of war, supplying and sustaining the battlefield. In its long imperial history, logistics was responsible for fueling men and machines, that's a quote, um, in battle for the Romans. And this meant, sorry, for the Romans, this meant feeding thousands of horses um, and, and soldiers on the move. And you can see here just some of the kinds of logistical challenges associated with this movement. Um, the thousands of horses that were needed to, to carry fodder for thousands of horses, um, such that um, um, we could say that strategy had to be adapted to account for horses' needs. And that's um, McConnell Hardiman and um, Ransberg uh, from 2010. Just moving um, a screen that's blocking my own screen. There we go. Um, so fueling troops was such an enduring problem um, that Napoleon would later call for a whole new approach to food preservation. He offered a large reward to an inventor who could design an effective system for conserving soldiers' rations. And this was the context for the um, invention of metal canning techniques and a whole range of other food preservation techniques like, like you're seeing represented here by Nicholas Appert. To this day, feeding soldiers remains vital to the work of logistics um, often actually referred to by militaries, including the US military as sustainment. But the wider question of fueling imperial circuitry, circuitry remains key. As Fred Moten and Stefano Harney have, um, um, have argued, modern logistics emerged through gruesome imperial circulations like the transatlantic slave trade. And I think Simone Brown's work has also done a, a whole lot to help us think through the kind of genesis of various kinds of security um, practices on the slave ship. We could also think about the transatlantic, sorry, we could also think about the movements westward that devastated indigenous societies and ecologies on Turtle Island. So while logistics has long been critical to warfare with the rise of industrial war and especially petroleum, um, it, became, it became a leading um, art of war uh, in relation to strategy and tactics. As fueling war and empire became more complex, it also became more definitive. The revolution in logistics in the post-World War II period saw the harnessing of military methods of supplying the front for corporate operations. Before the revolution, logistics was a martial art of moving and provisioning men and munitions. After the revolution, logistics emerged as a management science of materials movement across production and distribution in both the corporate and military sector. Logistics transformed not just distribution, and this, um, this slide here, the LMI, which is their new um, uh, acronym, doesn't reveal what they are. It's the Logistics Management Institute, which is now a kind of um, private, uh, but, but public-private uh, institution that was really essential in um, kind of heralding the logistics revolution in the early 1960s. So you can just see this kind of um, simultaneously military and civilian um, framing of the problem. So logistics uh, transformed um, not just distribution, but racial capitalism itself, its relationship to questions of circulation and containment and to matters of life and premature death, to paraphrase Ruthie Gilmore. In fact, the power of logistics lies not only in matters of physical distribution, but also in the production of life in imperial motion. To try to quickly get at, um, to try to quickly and effectively um, get at some of the power of logistics logics, I wanna share a very short video um, it's the trailer for um, a, a National Geographic special series called Great Migrations. And by Great Migrations, they're not referring to the largest ever mi internal migration in the US of African-Americans in search um, of safety and survivance. Um, rather, they're talking about animal movements. Um, National Geographic called Great Migrations its most ambitious programming initiative to date, the most arduous undertaking in its 122 year history. Um, and uh, the show premiered in 2010, so it's a little bit older, um, but it premiered in 330 million homes in 166, uh, 166 countries and 34 languages. So I'm just going to share that with you now.
So Great Migrations is about the importance of circulation and the threat of disruption. The series itself offers a thrilling four hour romp through a ruthless social Darwinist world defined by necropolitics and reproductive heteronormativity. Individual episodes carry the titles Born to Move, Need to Breed, Race to Survive, and Feast or Famine. The series narrator, Alec Baldwin, instructs us to move or die, quite literally. Survival requires circulation. Move or die is perhaps a much more direct and honest statement than just in time. But in case it feels like I'm demanding a kind of leap in faith and connecting this to questions of uh, logistics, I brought another even shorter, like really, really short video from Great Migration's uh, major sponsor, um, UPS. And so I'm just gonna show that now so you can get a sense of, okay. Every fall, the red crabs of Christmas Island undertake a great migration made possible by great logistics. They have limited time to ensure the survival of their species. Departures are synchronized. Contingency planning overcomes obstacles. And just in time, they deliver their eggs. In their world, just like ours, on-time arrivals depend on logistics. UPS is a proud sponsor of Great Migrations on the National Geographic Channel. Every fall. Sorry. So when I first watched the series, um, that vi that the when the advertisement comes on, it had it had just they had just finished the segment on um, those crabs, and so it was like this kind of seamless entry into the advertisement, the sponsor's advertisement. So stories of the natural world both reflect and reproduce norms of human sociality. Donna Haraway famously argues that Jane Goodall's oops. Uh, Jane Goodall's um, relationships with primates, for example, provided narration for an anxious West at a time of African decolonization. Her analysis of what was before Great Migrations, National Geographic's most popular production, um, Jane, Jane Goodall's Adventures with the Chimpanzees of Tanzania, highlights the global political context of this white woman's communion with the primates. Most importantly, Haraway emphasizes the work of this interspecies intimacy in framing the post-war era, era of African decolonization on aggressively colonial terms. Uh, Great Migration um, uh, marks itself, markets itself in direct relation to this 1965 program, they refer to it over and over again, as the advanced technology installment in the march of progress of geographic knowledge. National Geographic outlines how, quote, in ways that the founding members of the society could only fathom Migration is the key to intricacies of life on Earth. But unlike Goodall's pedagogy for post-colonization, there's no human presence here. As executives from UPS and National Geographic explain, the ads were specifically designed to create an association between animal migratory behavior and the logistics that allow UPS to unfailingly ship millions of packages around the globe. Um, the VP of Media Sales for National Geographic explained that the UPS um, quote, emphasis on logistics provided proved to be a great contextual fit with what Great Migrations is all about. It was a sort of marriage made in heaven. But in reality, the logistics of more than human life is less about move or die than move to die. And in fact, we might learn more about contemporary planetary logistics of life and death by looking to JBS rather than UPS. JBS is the Brazilian-based global meat giant and the world's largest, quote, animal protein provider. In 2007, financed in part by U.S. investment firms BlackRock and Blackstone, JBS entered the, li the U.S. livestock market through a buyout of Swift and Company. COVID-19 outbreaks at their Greeley facility have been among the largest and most lethal in the United States. Along with prisons, care facilities, and distribution centers, Meat processing plants have been ground zero for pandemic outbreaks with striking impacts on precarious, often migrant workers, mostly of color. After decades of corporate consolidation, a small number of American slaughterhouses process billions of pounds of meat each year. At full capacity, the JBS plant in Greeley that you see pictured here with um, memorials to the workers who passed um, because of the COVID um, outbreak, um, at its full capacity, this facility can process 5,400 cattle a day, making it one of the largest beef plants in the country. COVID outbreaks occur because of working conditions and productivity demands that make meaningful distancing impossible um, because of the lack of provisioning of PPE and because of the social determinants of health. Sorry, that's where I should be. 
The outbreak, outbreaks led to plant closures, creating enormous bottlenecks in the profoundly industrial and logistical meat sector. In the US and elsewhere, the infection and premature death of processing plant workers, not only their extraordinary labor actions, have been a source of supply chain disruption. And the massive and not at all humane calls of animal life have been one of the gruesome costs. Millions or more than, of more than human lives have been premature, prematurely extinguished, sometimes by disrupting air circulation, turning off ventilation systems, the critical infrastructures that support livestock breath to produce slow mass and inhumane suffocation. This crisis is horrific, but logistics does not simply come into play with the movement of livestock from the farm to the slaughterhouse, but in the very design of the pig or cow itself. The logistics of livestock production have reshaped the very form of the pig or cow to enhance the efficiency of the supply chain. For supply chain management, the pig is hardly a life form at all, but one stage of pork as commodity in the cycle of value realization and profit maximization. It's been dramatically reconfigured as a life form towards that end. Swine hips are now standardized to fit the machines of slaughter. Um, in the corporate meat sector, every aspect of the cycle of life has been reorganized by supply chain management and its softwares so that the animal fits the system of motion. Logistics reaches quite literally right in. As one industry textbook explains, logistics, not science, is the underpinning of a successful breeding policy that includes everything from ovulation synchronization for reproductive efficiency to the timing and insemination and weaning of cows and sows to fit trucking schedules, themselves organized to maximize efficiency at processing facilities. In the meat supply chain, livestock is subject to more and more logistical refashioning, though the sector was also a key innovator in modern ind industrial logistics. The corporate meat supply chain is now organized as a conveyor belt, not simply after animal death, but for the production of animal life. And while the sector has become ground zero for supply, chains, supply chain disruption, meat has long been at the forefront of imperial logistics at a continental scale. So Henry Ford is often credited um, with the re reorganization of, the mass, of mass production into the assembly line, but he first saw the conveyor belt in action in Gustavus, Gustavus Swift's Chicago slaughterhouses. A literal disassembly line, carcasses were suspended from a trolley system that accelerated the circulation of meat and capital before adapting them to the auto plant. This is the same Swift company that was recently taken over by JBS and to which we'll return again shortly. Meat processing has long been at the forefront of corporate logistical life. Gustavus Franklin Swift's may have inspired Ford with his disassembly line, but it was his re refrigerated rail car that allowed processed beef um, rather than live cattle to be shipped to the east, linking the industrial cities um, of the east with increased efficiency to the farms of the western frontier. Midwest, the Midwest and prairies could only become the stockyards of America by virtue of the railroad. The railroad connected these ranges with the abattoirs of the Midwest and the hungry cities on the eastern seaboard. But even before that, it was the railroad that was the key colonial infrastructure for the clearing of the plains. Across Turtle Island, railroads became the key infrastructure in the colonial war against First Peoples. Through it, a vast expanse of indigenous uh, territories were forcibly consolidated under the jurisdiction of settler states. On both sides of the medicine line, the railroads prompted and enabled land theft on the Great Plains, and they did so through a logistical war on indigenous food supplies. I want to highlight a couple of things here. First of all, that this map of the, the bison range um, is clearly uh, continental, not national. Um, so for American um, people in the audience, um, you can see very clearly that this is a, a continental geography. Um, but I also want to highlight that this, this earliest break in the herd's range um, was actually, uh, in a sense, a marker of the railroad. That was the, 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 the path of the first American transcontinental railroad. Um, so lands were cleared for the coming railroad, while the railroad also became a colonial weapon to clear the land. They were, they were critical in the extermination of the buffalo that had roamed Turtle Island's central plains, reaching north to Alaska and the Yukon territories and south through the state of Georgia. In just a few decades, the buffalo herds were hunted to near ex extinction with devastating consequences for indigenous peoples whose lifeways were profoundly entangled with the buffalo, 
Settler states saw the buffalo slaughter as logistical warfare to clear the plains of indigenous peoples through extermination of their food supply. This is painfully clear in some of the quotes you see here um, and in, in US General Custer, Custer's directive to quote, kill every buffalo you can, every buffalo dead is an Indian gone. Uh, James Daschuk has further documented how with the disappearance of the buffalo, Canadian officials used food or rather denied food as a means to ethnically cleanse a vast region from, from Regina to the Alberta border as the Canadian Pacific Railroad took shape. And the railroad um, in the Canadian context was actually a British um, Imperial Railroad, um, which in a sense uh, heralded the creation of the Canadian settler state. Um, this is um, here figured is uh, Prime Minister Macdonald, um, the kind of um, overseer of the project and the kind of champion of the railroad project figured here in a kind of police uniform um, in this kind of gruesome configuration where indigenous people are being given this um, impossible ultimatum, um, kind of gesturing at the buffalo jump. Um, and then you see the railroad itself, the steam uh, billowing here um, with the mark of civilization and all the settlers following suit. Um, so Prime Minister MacDonald actually referred to the railroad as the spine of the, the new settler state. Um, so a key rationale for the British um, Imperial Railroad or the Canadian uh, uh, Transcontinental Railroad was its role in asserting the border against American invasion. Deliberate starvation was used to force indigenous people off their territories and into reserves. Um, and when organized resistance to colonial dispossession took shape, um, for instance, in the 1885 uprising of indigenous um, Métis and Cree peoples, the Transcontinental Railroad transported Canadian militia forces to the front lines of colonial wars um, and then providing uh, the settler state with a kind of definitive logistical advantage as it's, as it's been kind of recorded in mainstream history. So um, a massive public-private partnership um, in the Canadian context, the railroad was financed first and, and foremost by land theft. That's the case in the US as well. The railroad companies became um, the major um, uh, land, um, uh, in, in major force in enclosing and selling off um, uh, lands in the prairies. Um, enormous tracts of indigenous land were granted to the Dominion government, by the Dominion government to the railroad companies. And in Canada, the railroad, um, you can see here, you know, this again was a kind of transnational uh, land sale with um, very, very large, you know, 800,000 acres, 5 million acres being sold to buyers, investors um, in especially Britain and the United States. Um, but this was also um, a case where the Canadian railroad was selling lands to individual settlers. Um, so white settlers were encouraged and incentivized to settle with proximity to whiteness as the means for sorting racial settler hierarchies. And I've been spending time in our, the archives and learning a lot about the very specific ways in which racial hierarchies were organized at this time. I'd be very happy to talk about that in the discussion period. Black migration was specifically and actively discouraged by both informal means and formal means at every spatial scale. Um, banks and bankers feasted on this infrastructure of enclosure, and through it, they circulated capital extracted from the theft of bodies, labor, and lands throughout the colonized world. And so this is the Barings Bank was one of the banks that stepped in um, to kind of save the, the Canadian Transcontinental Railroad near um, when it was in crisis near in its final years of being constructed. Um, and I've just assembled here, this is, you know, one of the largest uh, merchant banks in the world while it was in existence, um, uh, certainly at its height, it was sometimes referred to as the sixth empire, the sixth European empire. Um, and you can just see here some of the, the kinds of circulations of capital that these were payments um, that uh, were made to uh, slaveholders um, on, on, um, after emancipation. Um, and this was all financed um, by the Barings Bank, as well as the Barings Bank individual um, Barings family members were um, beneficiaries of these payments. Uh, so in addition to all of that, um, uh, one of the Barings, Edward Barings, who was also um, known as Lord Revelstoke, um, had his name kind of commemorated in a station in the Canadian Transcontinental uh, Railroad at Revelstoke Station. Um, uh, to acknowledge the bank's crucial capital injection into the infrastructure. So the railroads were also bound up in complex racialized labor regimes that particularly impacted Chinese and black workers. Um, in the US and in Canada, the most dangerous parts of construction were assigned to Chinese workers. Underpaid and relying on their own provisions and medical care, 
Chinese workers died at a rate of two for every kilometer in the treacherous stretch of the Rocky Mountains. Black workers were recruited as porters with conditions of work that rivaled slavery. The rail carried white passengers into intimate fantasies of racial subservience, and it carried racialized workers to premature deaths. The railroad companies transformed indigenous territories into settler property, but colonial circulatory infrastructure required colonial security infrastructure. What is now the Canadian, uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police was created in 1873 as a paramilitary force to protect the colonial order both internally where settler jurisdiction had been already asserted and externally where it remained an ambition. Jasker and Dillon argues that the Mounties carried out quote, genocidal extermination, subjugation and physical containment of indigenous communities. They were deployed on the Canadian frontier to facilitate indigenous people's subjection to colonial law and to ensure the negation of indigenous sovereignty and implement effective policies of containment and surveillance. And we could include things like the pass system, which um, you know, was a kind of almost like a passport system that required indigenous plains people to get a kind of documented permission to leave their reserves as an example of this. So police force was specifically created to clear the way for the railroad and to protect the infrastructure as it was built. Protecting the infrastructures of colonization was a critical means of conquest. In 1885, Mounties saw their jurisdictions expanded at the direct request of the railroad company to protect the infrastructure as it laid new tracks west of the Rockies. Mountains were, uh, Mounties were also deployed to break the strikes of rail workers laying tracks through the mountains. Uh, and later in 1920, when um, uh, Prime Minister MacDonald's genocidal residential school system became compulsory, Mounties were charged um, with ensuring uh, quote unquote attendance, uh, which we could think about as kidnapping children and transporting them often by rail to the residential schools. Infrastructures like railroads um, are the social socio-technical systems assembled to sustain or expand reproduction. Decades ago, David Harvey argued that crises of capitalist motion can be temporarily resolved through the production of built infrastructure, what he termed a spatial fix, quite famously. Ruthie Gilmore writes that in the material world, infrastructure speeds some processes and slows down others, setting agendas, producing isolation and enabling cooperation. Assuming a capacious materiality, Lauren Berlant helpfully defines infrastructure as the movement or patterning of social form. Um, while years ago, Doreen Massey argued that especially transportation and communication infrastructures produce power geometries, speeding up motion and connectivity for some, but in ways that erect barriers or slow down the motion of others. So dams, ports, roads, rails, pipelines, prisons, and cables enable and constrain particular configurations of motion and of reproduction. Time-space compression though, as I've um, sort of hinted at and as my wider work is trying to explore in more depth, um, requires security infrastructures precisely because indigenous and anti-colonial forces refuse and resist. Imperial infrastructures support the flourishing of some at the expense of others. Infrastructure is vital to biological and social reproduction, but as Winona Leduc and I have argued, colonial infrastructures dispossess, extract, and accumulate. Black, Indigenous, and anti-colonial writers, like so many um, amazing scholars, um, including folks like Audra Simpson, um, Lale Khalili, Mashwana Goman, um, uh, um, Manu Karuka, um, uh, you know, we could go on and on, it's a, it's a big list, um, have all kind of made this case, and they explore the under, infrastructural underpinnings of imperialism. For Leanne Simpson, it's a colonial hydro dam that disrupts her people's life ways, their rhythms and motions by fragmenting the movement of waters and fish. And here for Nick Estes, um, Nick Estes suggests that while there are infrastructures of indigenous resistance, they confront infrastructures of settler colonialism in the form of police, prisons, dams, and oil pipelines that intend to destroy, replace, and erase. So the brutal afterlives of railroad colonialism are profoundly intimate and human, but they also take the shape of entire ecologies. Winona Leduc emphasizes the scale of 19th century colonial ecological destruction. Quote, there were, there, were, there were then more than 250 types of grass, along with the profusions of prairie dogs, purple corn flowers, prairie turnips, mushrooms, and a host of other species listed today as endangered and protected or protected. Those 50 million buffalo have been replaced by farms and 45 million cattle. Manu Karuka describes how railroad colonialism 
transformed bountiful prairie lands into massive monocrops areas for beef, pork, and grain production. In 1803, in what Nick Estes describes as the largest real estate transaction in world history, known today as the Louisiana Purchase, the US bought an enormous tract of land from France. It was in fact Bearings Bank um, of the Canadian Railroad fame that financed this, this extraordinary deal. The Sioux Nation, or Ocheti Sekouin, eventually signed peace treaties with the invading American settler state to bring an end to the wars against them. And I'll just locate, that's where Greeley, um, Colorado and the JBS plant is, uh, firmly located within these, um, the lands of the Fort Laramie treaties, which provided this temporary retrieve and a 25 million acre territory for the Ocheti Sekouin. With the buffalo slaughter and settler invasion, Estes describes how this vast land base was steadily diminished. Foregrounding the invasion of rail and hydro dams historically and oil pipelines more recently, Estes traces how settler violations of the Fort Laramie treaties provide context for the extraordinary Standing Rock uprising and the ongoing legal action to restore these indigenous lands. This transformation of plains ecology into imperial stockyard that began with European colonization has a contemporary echo in the rapid destruction of the Amazon rainforest. In the Amazon, log logistics infrastructure is remaking critical planetary ecologies to this day. This extraordinary ecosystem has been in the unmaking for years and is now projected to collapse later this century. Yet the last few years have been drastically, have, have seen drastically increased rates of destruction. Protection of the Amazon, 60% of which stands in the territory claimed by Brazil, is crucial to the continued existence of life on earth as we know it. Home to indigenous and African descendant people who have fiercely defended their homelands, the Amazon is the source of a fifth of the world's oxygen supply, the so-called lungs of the earth, um, and the moisture that evaporates from the Amazon rains on farmlands across, across South America and up all the way into the US Midwest. So catastrophic fires have garnered global media attention in the Amazon, but less prominent is the convergence, is, sorry, the coverage, in the coverage is the way that deforest, deforestation is taking shape to make way for an extractive industrial economy financed and underpinned by logistical infrastructure. Deforestation closely follows the development of new road and rail infrastructure, and these kinds of satellite images show how clearly the roads themselves cut into and fragment forest canopy and intensify circulation and traffic in the Amazon. Infrastructure serves as a vector for deforestation with 95% of it taking place within 5.5 kilometers of roadways. Infrastructure furthermore enables development of more infrastructure, energy, industrial agriculture, and extractive systems become possible when transportation make, makes new lands accessible, much like we saw with the railroad. Transport infrastructure makes industrial agriculture viable in the Amazon. And in fact, cattle ranching has become the largest land use driving deforestation in every county um, with, with jurisdiction, sorry, every country with jurisdiction in the Amazon, accounting for 80% of the current de deforestation rates. But like in the Midwest, it's transportation infrastructure that underpins this industrial transformation. Amazonian infrastructure expansion is a linchpin in Bolsonaro's broader economic plans, including rail lines, ports, and roads that can, quote, overcome logistical obstacles standing in the way of exporting commodities and other goods. If all the components of Bolsonaro's current plans are completed, 40% of the Amazon could be deforested quite quickly. So JBS, as we heard, the world's largest animal protein provider is implicated in both the destruction of the Amazon and working conditions that have been called akin to slavery. BlackRock and um, the offshoot Blackstone that manages uh, more than $6 trillion in investments um, increased its stake in cattle through JBS in 2016 by $41 million. And again, in 2018, despite claims to sustainable supply chains. And indeed, US finance is heavily implicated in the development of the Amazonian infrastructure. Grimm goes so far um, as to name Blackstone's CEO as the driving force be behind Amazon's deforestation, the Amazon deforestation. US-based Blackstone, the world's largest asset management firm, has major stakes in an enormous terminal and highway project to support industrial agricultural expansion that's under construction now. So the species diversity within the Amazon is unparalleled on the planet. 
It's the extraordinary scale, ecological complexity, and abundance of the rainforest and its extraordinary river system that led Jeff Bezos in 1994 to rename his fledgling distribution platform, which was then called Calabra, to, the, to what we now know it as Amazon. You can find untold riches and resources in the Amazon, or at least you could. But it's not just the rest of us earthlings that rely on the critical Amazonian ecosystem. Amazon, the corporation, does as well. So in this critical re-engage, in this critical engagement with logistics, I'm promoting a politics of, not against, motion. While move or die or move to die may be a kernel logic of racial and supply chain capitalism, it's clearly not the only way to organize infrastructure, organize an infrastructure life in motion. As Nail writes, for Marx, everything is in motion, not just capitalism. Oops, sorry. The issue for Marx is not between capitalist movement and revolutionary stasis. The question is how a specifically capitalist pattern of circulation works, end quote. Capitalism for Marx is a regime of motion defined by dispossession and exploitation. Jody Malamed also emphasizes the violent motions of racial capitalism when she writes, capital can only be capital when it is accumulating and it can only accumulate by producing and moving through relations of severe inequality among human groups. Marx's extended focus on motion is associated with volume, volumes two and three of capital, but the argument that capitalism is in itself a regime of motion lies at the center of his most fundamental and basic theory of value in his general formula for capital. The capitalist regime of motion is identical to what he terms expanded reproduction. Here, rep reproduction is not characterized by subsistence. Instead, capital is accumulated as it moves from money to commodity um, and then back to money form. It's not just magic that makes expanded reproduction possible, but theft. Surplus rather than survival becomes the end game of reproduction in its end game of reproduction within a capitalist regime of motion. Or as Rosa Luxemburg explains, profit becomes an end in itself, the decisive factor which determines not only production, but also reproduction. Theft is typically thought of in terms of labor surplus, but as Dene scholar Glenn Coulthard argues, if we take colonialism seriously, then expanded reproduction may equally or additionally entail theft of land and more than human life. Ruthie Gilmore reminds us um, that motion takes different forms that are related but not identical. She insists that capital circulates through captive humans whose own motion is disrupted by their containment in carceral and we could add plantation space. Physical movement is critically important and for Marx even a source of value. Yet he also suggests that capital circulation can quote, take place without physical movement. Um, and he goes on to say a house that is sold from A to B circulates as a commodity, but it does not get up and walk. This does not make physical motion less important, only more complex. While these forms of motion are not identical, they also can't really ever be disentangled. Physical circulation has the special capacity to accelerate the circulation of capital. So the circulation of legal documents and financial transactions are necessary to sanction the house sale. And these are undeniably material. Luxembourg um, sees these two forms of motion as necessarily entangled, making expanded reproduction inherently imperial. It is, not, it is driven not only, quote, by a permanent incentive to reproduction in general, she writes, but also a, a motive for its expansion for reproduction on an ever larger scale. For Luxembourg, expanded reproduction inevitably relies on geographic expansion. So logistics, the, the, the kind of overarching theme of our, of our time together today, the, the theme of my work and talk, um, aims to optimize material circulation in the image of expanded reproduction. Alongside these diagnoses, though, of the violence of colonial and racial capitalist circulation are vital visions of anti-colonial life in motion. Writing from the territory where I speak, indigenous scholar and artist Leanne Simpson explores how Anishinaabe life worlds are anchored in motion. Simpson writes, quote, being enmeshed in the cyclical flux of the Earth Lodge, Anishinaabe people traveled throughout their localized territories in seasonal fashion. Our lifeway required cyclical and rhythmical movements. Society and clan structure expanded and contracted like a beating heart or working lungs. Simpson engages Weisner's seminal work on the concept of transmotion, which posits that, quote, natives have always been on the move by chance, necessity, barter, reciprocal sustenance, and by trade over extensive routes, 
the actual motion is a natural right and the tribal stories of transmotion are a continuous sense of vision, visionary sovereignty. We could also um, uh, look to Octavia Butler, who's been described as a black radical feminist theorist, theorist historiographer and researcher across fields and disciplines. Um, she was also deeply invested in motion. In her extraordinary novel, The Parable of the Sower, life is motion and God is change. Like the biblical figure who struggles to find fertile soil to sow seeds for a future, Butler's brand of radical reproduction requires that we cultivate change. As Butler ex ex exclaims, we can focus them, alter their speed or impact. In general, we can shape change, but we can't stop uh, change no matter how hard we try. Throughout the universe, the ongoing reality is change. Indeed, motion is the heart of black radical and feminist thought through figurations of fugitivity. Sadie Hartman, for Sadie Hartman, movement constitutes a kind of um, deeply situated faith in futurity. She writes, the thought of what might be possible was indistinguishable from moving bodies in the transient rush and flight of black folks in the city within the city. Huey Newton likewise prescribed a form of black radicalism tethered to change, asserting we believe that everything is in a constant state of change. So we employ a framework of thinking that can put us in touch with the process of change. And of course, CLR James too centers social motion in his work, um, uh, in, in, um, in his work on empire and its contestation uh, for, for James are matters of motion as he outlines in Beyond a Boundary, where he talked about um, time would pass, old empires would fall and new ones would take um, their place. Um, he goes on um, to talk about how um, movement um, is at the center of, of the social motion. And of course, um, if we move from writers um, to contemporary practitioners, um, there is a vibrant ecology of multiracial uh, BIPOC led movements working today to defend and protect other ways of organizing motion and reproduction, um, non and, and or anti colonial ways of organizing the motions of life itself. So um, you can see a few of them here. I'll just say a brief word about, uh, about um, these different mo movement, movements and, and actions before I come back to Amazon and wrap us up. So in 2020, in direct response to the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs calls for support and solidarity following another RCMP raid of their territories, dramatic and sustained, sustained actions proliferated across the Canadian railway network. Um, the Mounties had violently raided the unceded territories of the Wet'suwet'en nation to clear the way for corporate construction of a natural gas pipeline, arresting land defenders and leadership, destroying community infrastructures and interrupting ceremony. The raid went on for days. Um, under Wet'suwet'en law, authority over the nation's 22,000 square kilometers of unceded territory lies with the hereditary chiefs from five clans in a system of governance that long predates colonization. Indigenous peoples and their allies blockaded the national rail network, launching um, the shutdown Canada movement. And you can see, this is like the official map that was published in one of our major newspapers, the Globe and Mail. You can see um, just the extent of which, of, of sites of, of blockades and disruptions to rail, especially, but also port and road uh, networks. But I also wanna show this kind of activist crowdsourced version because um, if, in fact, if you zoomed out, it would be even more transnational, but you can see here that the, 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 res the resistance and, uh, and blockades and, and um, protests were not contained at all within the Canadian nation state, much more um, uh, echoing the colonial cartographies of Turtle Island. So coast to coast occupations, especially of rail lines and intermodal ports, highways and bridges and central city streets by indigenous land defenders and their allies had decisive impact flows of commuters and commodities that, it, that have come to rely on rapid circulation ground to a halt, standing in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en and standing immediately atop the transcontinental railroad tracks, Mohawk land protectors offered teachings about the original treaties that past and present infrastructures trespass, materially invoking the infrastructural violence at the heart of this, of this settler state's colonial problem. Mohawk land protectors created the space and opportunity for moving forward differently. And indeed, as Indigenous peoples have um, long insisted, and especially maybe that was popularized around the Standing Rock um, struggle, um, the language of protector over protester is key here. 
And in the context of what I've been describing, the idea that there are multiple ways of organizing motion, um, the idea of defending other ways of life and other ways of motion and reproduction is itself um, really something to, to dwell in. And I wanna flag the work of um, my wonderful colleague, Michelle Daigle, um, a Cree scholar who's been working on indigenous river mobilities and placemaking. Um, really look out for her uh, really powerful work on these questions. So movements um, against police violence have also um, you know, been, uh, of course, uh, abolitionist movements have also been um, really key and um, in, often in concert um, with or in solidarity with indigenous protests um, across Turtle Island. Um, in some cases, very explicitly naming the RCMP in the Canadian context um, uh, as the kind of target of their actions, but also a much broader uh, question of policing as um, uh, a source of control and violence against Black people's mobilities. So abolition, um, uh, abolition um, protests and, and actions have shut down highways in ways um, that echo historically Black movements against the violence of urban renewal and highway projects, and again, highlight the violence of racial capitalist infrastructures that aim to control Black mobilities. Indigenous and Black mobilities um, against the dis sorry, Indigenous and Black movements against the destruction of the Amazon um, have also been in, in, in deeply invested in not just protesting, but protecting and building um, alliance, solidarity, and future life. So with that, I want to return to the Amazon labor union organizing, which is, I think, a key part of this big chorus that I've been describing. They are a key force in the widespread refusal and re resistance taking shape across the logistical political ecology. The Amazon Labor Union intervenes in the ruthless politics of supply chain capitalism by fighting for a different politics, especially of motion and connection. Amazon's intense connectivity between distant places for commodity circulation is achieved through dividing and disconnecting workers from each other and from place. High-speed connection across place, across space, is achieved by keeping workers disconnected from each other in an anti-relational racial capitalist politics. Amazon's ability to deliver almost instantly relies on this kind of ruthless productivity, as it's been described, um, and um, pressures across the supply chain create incredible rates of worker injury, something I've also um, uh, seen and looked at in the context of transport workers, longshore workers, um, and other uh, logistics workers. Amazon has a kind of shocking turnover rate of 150%, with most workers lasting less than a year on the job. And in a recent organizing event with the Jacobin, ALU organizers, um, especially Neves and Maldonado, referred to themselves and others um, who had been there. And I just want to highlight, um, sorry, I should just highlight, first of all, that we're not machines, we're human beings, you know, really pushing back against this kind of um, productivist and um, speed oriented logistical economy. Um, and then this union start with you, if you, you can kind of look at these, these claims, um, uh, job safety, longer breaks, and job security all are about kind of politics of motion um, and, and emplacement. So um, um, these, AMA, these ALU organizers um, refer to themselves and others who had been on the job at Amazon's um, fulfillment center um, as old timers because they'd been on the job for two to three years. So this is a very specific kind of sector we're talking about. So much has also been said about the lack of breaks or the really um, um, the you know impossibly short breaks that have led to people urinating in bottles and becoming ill um, for lack of, uh, of, of health breaks. Um, and indeed the organization of, of workers time is at the center of those ALU demands as I suggested. The idea that we're not machines, we're human beings um, is a nod to worker complaints about these, these kind of um, issues of time, um, questions of safety, um, security, and, um, and the, the break from the, the workers' line. So um, the ALU workers have also refused strategies to racialize um, workers. That there was an interesting discussion of that that sadly got a little cut short in this recent event. Um, but have really described um, their relations to other workers as kin, uh, forming relationships of like kinship relations. And kin relations have also been incredibly important in this very small grassroots um, effort. As you can see here, references um, to uh, Chris Smalls's brother. Um, this is an image from, I'll just have to credit Brett Story and Steve Mang. Brett Story um, is currently working on a documentary with the ALU and was kind enough to share this image. I, I'm so excited for her work and 
um, and, and this um, opportunity to learn more about the ALU's work that's forthcoming. So look out for that. Um, but at the center, you can see these kinds of um, uh, bio, bio kin networks, but also the making of kin networks that kind of refuse the disembodied and, and, and divided uh, kinds of dis dislocatedness of the workplace. And of course, we've heard a ton about food. Um, I can't um, uh, uh, miss to talk to say something about food, which was not a, not just a small um, aspect of what what we've heard in mainstream media, but also what the organizers have described as a way of making place, as a way of building relations, as a way of bringing people together, and importantly, a way of, of, of convening multiracial um, uh, coalitions of workers uh, into a space of learning and um, mutual care. And so with that, I just want to, um, I'm happy to talk more about that, but I just want to wrap up with, with one reflection. Um, because of this question of movement has been key, but so has this question of fueling and feeding. And um, in recent work that I've done with Winona LeDuc, um, we've, we've argued that infrastructure has to be a kind of central component for any kind of uh, meaningful decolon decolonial work on Turtle Island. And we um, refer to the kinds of um, really inspiring um, and, um, and um, uh, efforts and initiatives underway um, that that um, fuel a kind of life-giving politics um, as elementary infrastructures, not accidentally referring to um, the question of food and feeding. So I'll leave it there and I welcome questions and comments um, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Now it is time for Q&A everyone. Uh, Professor Cowan has given a very rich presentation so I am certain uh, that the discussion is going to be amazing. Um, you can pose a question in one of two ways. The first is to type it into the chat and I will read it out for you. Or you can raise your hand and I will ask you to unmute yourself, turn on your video and ask your question directly to Deb. In order to raise your hand, just navigate down to the bottom of your screen in the reaction section and click on raise your hand. And I will uh, look for you there. So let me see. Don't be shy. Deb, your presentation was so fabulous. Everyone has been struck. You well, now I don't feel as bad for taking so much time. <laughs> Wonderful. John Johnson, I am going to ask you to turn on your camera and pose your question. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Thanks, uh, Deborah, for your uh, amazing talk. Very inspiring and, uh, and thought provoking. Uh, Karen and I are here, we've been listening. and. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about um, logistics, of course, and uh, I think you talked a lot about this in your presentation, but I, I am really interested in, in uh, the part about uh, your presentation that speaks to the possibility of logistics being uh, regenerative and anti-colonial. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering if you could share more of your thoughts on, on what that entails or what that could look like. How, how can these sort of regenerative, uh, if I can call it that, logistics, uh, kind of be rooted in non-Western, uh, Indigenous, uh, uh, Black uh, systems of thought. What might they look like? So thank you. <laughs> thanks so much, John. Should I, I should go ahead. Okay. Um, thanks so much, John. And nice to see you and Karen both. Hi. Um, yeah, it's a great question. And I I've got a lot of thoughts about that. I'll try and just keep them brief, um, but I'm always happy to talk more uh, and another time too. Um, I mean, first thing I'll say is that in a way what logistics um, describes is social reproduction, right? It's, it's in a sense, a kind of corporatized and militarized version of sustaining communities. And the language of sustainment, I don't think is an accident. The fact that that's increasingly being used by military forces to describe what they're doing is sustaining forces. Um, a lot of it is really about feeding and fueling um, fueling, you know, historically um, non-human animals, but increasingly, of, of course, um, machines of various kinds, um, but also housing, you know, all the things that make it possible to, for the military to, um, to wage war. Um, and I think for the, 
corporate sector, um, you know, part of my earlier work was really interested in that moment of, um, of over entanglement that never has ceased. So it's not like it went from military to corporate and now it's corporate and not, you know, it's, it's simultaneously both. Um, but at the same time, um, if we think about what those projects are fundamentally about, feeding, um, fueling, sustaining communities, um, I think that there's a lot of really interesting openings um, that many, many people and communities are taking up. So I'll name a couple. There's one really interesting initiative actually in, in Treaty 9 territory, um, Kitchenamekusa Benanuig. Um, is a remote northern community that I'm sure you're familiar with, but not everyone here will be. Um, it's about 700 kilometers north of Thunder Bay, uh, and it's an, a, you know, an amazing um, uh, community that has fought all kinds of extractive industries. One of the things that, like many northern communities, they face is incredible difficulty in accessing nutritious, affordable food. Um, and so there's there's folks in Kitchenamikusa and Anuig who have been working on what they're calling a food logistics project, um, working in collaboration with other First Nations and with the Lakso um, First Nation and the, some of the airport, northern airport hubs uh, to actually organize food supplies and distribution in a non-capitalist way. Um, I think that's, I don't, there's only the beginnings of that work, but I think it's, it's really promising and exciting. And what it points us to maybe more broadly is the fact that there's all kinds of ways of using um, technology, of course, um, but also, um, you know, advanced calculative knowledge and sciences um, to think about um, organizing systems of supply, but, uh, but according to logics of care um, and provisioning um, otherwise. So I would say that the you know in some it's, in some instances the word is uh, is the problem rather than the practice, but even the word is being reclaimed. And I and I'm also reviewing right now in a really amazing paper that takes off on queer logistics, um, thinking about again um, what it might mean to think about um, the part of logistics that is important, right? The kinds of uh, connection, circulation, provisioning, and sustaining peoples and communities, um, but without the, the, you know, the violent corporate and militarist uh, kinds of um, uh, frames and finance, and then with a logic that's animated by care um, and desire. Um, so I think there's, there's, you know, there's so many possibilities. And Winona and I um, really were thinking about infrastructure specifically, but they're really inseparable. A lot of the kinds of infrastructure projects are about movement and circulation. And um, we're lucky to be part of a really great group of scholars, um, um, mostly Indigenous legal scholars, but some geographers um, and um, community uh, practitioners who are building all kinds of um, indigenous infrastructures across uh, Turtle Island and as well as some in the Caribbean. Um, so there's, I think there's um, increasing take up of this. I don't, I'm not so concerned about whether the word gets um, pulled forward, but I, I definitely think that there's a lot of ways to, to think about that question and it's a, it's a great one. So thank you so much, John. Thank you very much, John. That really was wonderful. Next, I will um, ask Harriet Friedman to um, turn on her camera and to ask her question. And then I will take a question from chat as well as from Wiley Sharp, so that Deb has three questions to mull over before she answers them. So please, Harriet, go ahead. Uh, first of all, Deb, that was just fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, put together pieces of history that I knew and many I didn't know. And um, I, I have a maybe a kind of quibbling kind of question about terminology. Um, the language of care, provision, sustaining sounds great, uh, but earlier on you were using the term subsistence. I think that might come from Marx, I'm not sure, as the contrast to accumulation. And um, I have a lot of problems with that word. Um, it is mostly used, as far as I can tell, um, to suggest some survival minimum, like in the UN uh, development program statistics um, or any of the UN statistics. It's the dollar a day or two dollars a day, which first of all monetizes it and it's crazy and nonsensical, but also um, suggests that, you know, we're talking about something really basic, whereas these other terms uh, are more like thriving rather than surviving. Um, and so, yeah, if you could just uh, say a word or two about that. Thanks so much for that question, Harriet. Uh, the next question comes to us via chat from Dina, who writes, to what extent does disaster colonialism impact the vulnerability of logistics and climate? 
So Dina, thank you so much for your question. And now for the third question, I'll take uh, Wiley Sharp. So Wiley, please turn on your camera and ask your question. Hey there, um, is, the, is the audio coming through all right? Okay, thanks um, Professor Cohen for the really an insightful lecture um, this afternoon. Um, I'm interested in um, your thoughts about uh, the connection between scales when we're talking about infrastructure and logistics. Um, these, these ideas are often thought of at a very high abstract level as um, these flows are conceptualized as um, being you know, across the globe over nation state boundaries, right? Um, but as you talk about like food as this essential kind of um, uh, infrastructure of resistance, perhaps, um, it makes me it makes me think about how the um, this infrastructure is constituted, in fact, by these everyday practices, um, embodied practices of eating, of um, you know, of sharing food, cooking with others, right? Um, so I'm curious if you have any thoughts about um, the ways in which these uh, different scales are are co-constituted and and how that opens up different imagination um, imaginaries of of resistance. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, th amazing questions. Uh, a lot to think about. And first, I'll just say um, to Harriet, um, it's, it's thank you for being here. It's such an honor to have you here with us. So, uh, you know, an expert on on food systems and um, and commodity chains and so much else. Um, so it's it's really generous of you to to share your time and your question. Um, and I agree with you. I mean, the language of subsistence. I don't I don't generally use it. I was really using it just to make the point the the point quickly of a contrast between a system that's based on uh, accumulation uh, and something more, more reproductive in the kind of traditional sense, which may involve some kinds of accumulation, but is not oriented and organized by accumulation. So I appreciate the point and terminology is important. And I will definitely take that into account in future um, uh, moments because yeah, the, the, even the language of survivance, I find, uh, you know, for coming from especially indigenous work, um, just so much more satisfying, but it was really just to make that point, the really simple point about the labor theory of value. <laughs> um, so thanks for that. Um, uh, there's, you know, lots of great questions. So I, I'm going to move on, um, briefly to the question of disaster and disruption. Um, another great question. I don't know who asked it, but, um, uh, it's actually, if you look at the cover of the, the book I did on logistics, the cover is um, an, an image of just that. It's a cover of, um, uh, it's an image of, you know, containers uh, in disarray um, after um, the uh, nuclear eruption in, in um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the nuclear d disruption, <laughs> disruptions in Japan and the kind of um, all the um, the disasters of the tsunami there um, and, and what kind of happened to supply chains. But one of the things I talk about it in my work on logistics is the ways in which this whole kind of paradigm that emerged uh, in the early years of, of the century um, to secure supply chains, this kind of new paradigm, which of course builds on much longer histories of policing and securitization of supply chains, but is also quite distinct and um, really emerges out of the 2001 kind of US uh, crisis. Um, uh, kind of interchangeably talks about things like labor disruptions, volcanic eruptions like the Icelandic one, um, uh, anti-colonial struggles, um, almost interchangeably as problems for the supply chain that can be quantified, um, oftentimes requiring different kinds of, of um, preemptive or reactive response. But that, you know, for instance, when they're talking about um, a natural, so-called natural disaster in one of the, um, the many new supply chain security textbooks, um, they actually use, a, a, at the time, recent labor disruption in the port of LA Long Beach to quantify the potential costs of a natural disaster. So um, for a certain kind of, you know, this field of supply chain security that's emerged, um, they, they really almost address them interchangeably. That's not to suggest that, you know, they are interchangeable. And of course, the dynamics of something like a tsunami or a volcanic eruption um, are quite different than, um, you know, a labor action or an anti-colonial struggle and or many other things that we could think of, just system failures, um, hacking, that sort of thing, which um, JBS actually experienced a huge one this past summer. They, you know, their whole cattle supply was shut down for a while in the U.S., um, so these are, you know, um, part of what's interesting about this, this model of supply um, is, or this model of security is that the, the problem of disruption is, is kind of um, isolated almost as 
um, as a, a as interchangeable. But I, I, there's a lot more to be said about that. And so I'm, I, if you have more to say about your question, I'd be happy to to be more precise. Um, and on this last uh, comment, Wiley, thank you so much for the question. I mean, it the question of scale is so crucial here. I almost want to turn it, you know, when we're talking about food systems, especially to Harriet, but um, I'm sure there's so much wisdom in this room. It is one of the central issues that I that you know I and others keep in, encountering in especially in, you know, coming back to John's question in these efforts to build alternative infrastructures and alternative logistical systems, um, especially as you've said, you know, the, the, you know, when we have systems like the kind I was discussing with, um, you know, a, a shutdown of a few days in one of these um, abattoirs can lead to like the call of millions of, of, of lives, of, of pig or cattle lives. Um, the scale question is is hovering very heavily, right? And as you said, we kind of move from these kind of global maps to the intimacies of the body very, very quickly in a talk like this. And I don't mean to do it in a way that's um, irresponsible, but really to map out some of the kinds of questions of power that are at stake here. Um, I guess, um, you know, to be to be brief about it, there's a lot of debate happening on this question. And I think that there's folks like, I, I think uh, Mike Davis gave a talk a couple of days ago where he was like, all these little mutual aid efforts, or <laughs> he said something very, you know, like that they're not gonna do anything in the face of, of the scale of the problem that we're encountering. And and while I agree with that to a certain extent, I think that to me, I'm, I'm you know, invested in and committed to on the ground politics. And one thing I've learned is that, you know, it doesn't have to be an either or. And one example I'll give you is um, um, small scale initiatives um, are to me a building block and a necessity of any kind of larger project. They can be networked in all kinds of ways. And I learned this um, ironically through um, an, a, a work I was doing with the longshore workers in the port of Vancouver who were actually forcibly organized at one point um, some of the, um, not the longshore workers, they were already unionized, but some of the port truckers were kind of unionized by their employer as a way of controlling um, wildcat strikes. And what the truckers told me, and I've never forgotten, is that um, organization, um, so certification without organization can be deadly, um, and it can really, you know, be a, a, a gift to the employer who can then control um, labor actions and that sort of thing, or order you back to work. Um, but organization um, um, without certification can be incredibly powerful. Of course, the ideal is the both together, right? Organization and certification. So you get the grassroots and, and the kind of scalar and, and legal mechanisms. Um, but I don't think that, I think I'm kind of, um, I'm not sure if this is even your question, but it's something that's been on my mind a lot as we think about how to how to take on the kind of scale of crises that we're facing, right? Like apocalyptic <laughs> um, crises of every kind. Uh, with what are inherently small grassroots initiatives often. And um, to me, the, the model has, you know, I think one of the things we learned from Standing Rock was that there was incredible power in networked actions, um, multiple um, or, or even more actions and organ forms of organizing that are locally embedded or, and then, but then connected in, in creative ways. Um, so in some ways, it's, it's the kind of a scale versus the kind of lateral networks. Um, and I think infrastructure actually lets us think that in very important ways, both in terms of the assembly of infrastructure and its kind of more formal senses and its informal senses. So we could think about the official railroads um, of the you know, era of railroad colonialism versus something like the Underground Railroad, which was incredibly effective and important. But not organized in these kinds of formal ways at, at that kind of scale, but by these kinds of networked efforts, um, courageous and impossible efforts, but that, you know, managed to do work that was transnational, trans, you know what I mean? So those are some of the thoughts I could share right now, but I'd also be very happy to talk with you further and hear your, any further questions, prompts that you have, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, the floor is open, everyone. We do have a few more minutes for another question or two for Professor Cowan. So please don't be shy. I will then invite Professor Cowan to have any concluding remarks. Uh, oh, excellent, Sarah, please. Uh, thank you so much. That was that was wonderful. Um, I have a question about, about pleasure um, and wondering if, if you've been thinking about that, because I was, I mean, I think it was for so many of us. Um, what's happening at, with ALU at Staten Island has been um, so pleasurable. Um, I don't know if that's the right word, but I'm, I'm thinking for the right affective term. And it's it's partly the narrative of, of, of the David and Goliath story. It's partly the sort of um, 
swerving against the um, racialized depiction of inarticulate that these e leaked emails and the you know the emerging face of the union that doesn't look like some some stereotypes. Um, that are sort of deeply embedded about what union organizers are supposed to look like. Um, but I was also thinking about the pleasure elicited in spite of myself by the National Geographic <laughs> clip that you showed, you know, where there's this kind of like, you know, I'm like somehow carried along against everything that I, you know, want by this like, you know, on the move need to breathe sort of stuff. So, so I guess I'm, I'm just wondering if if you're thinking right now, like what what's the extent of of pleasure and kind of in mobility and in networks, um, what's the place of that um, in progressive, radical, or otherwise movements vis-a-vis -vis the kinds of pleasures that, for example, the National Geographic is clearly, you know, trying to elicit and possibly definitely eliciting about, you know, these nature kind of doing what it needs to do, which of course is, is coded for something else, but. Thanks so much, Sarah. Such a great question. Um, and, you know, again, one that we could probably talk about, like if, if I was there and we were going to go for dinner, you know, we could talk about for a long time into the night. Um, and I would love to like share that, the, these, these conversations with others as well. It's a, it's a great question. And for me, um, I don't know if it's pleasure, but like certainly questions of desire, questions of possibility, questions, you know, um, and affect are very, very important to our, our, our politics. Um, I also, just as a note, before I answer that directly, I, you know, I, I don't think I was very explicit, but I also did want to kind of draw a little bit of a line because you mentioned like who is the face of the most inspiring labor organizing work. Um, uh, I, you know, the porters, um, I didn't really go into any detail here, but we could have. And right now there's actually a series that I think even Americans can access on CBC Gem. It's called online on the porters. It's meant to elicit a lot of pleasure, but the porter, the, the black porters, the railway porters, um, you know, not only transform, you know, we're, we're like a key force in um, black labor and labor politics much more widely, but transformed immigration policy in this country and so many other aspects of life that uh, are only now kind of being officially recognized. Um, so the, the extraordinary work of, of um, workers of color, right, in, in the, the actual labor movement um, of, of uh, the last century and beyond, um, I think just is still, there's still so much work to be done. But on the question of, um, yeah, so National Geographic, when I watch that, I, my heart actually races, <laughs> like I get really stressed out. Um, and, and uh, you know, I had to like not play it again uh, until we, we met here today because it really does make my heart race. Um, I, I'm very aff affected by it, um, but, I, but it's also why I wanted to kind of juxtapose that with um, the, the even more devastating, effectively devastating uh, questions of the slaughterhouses and the kind of logistical meat industry. Um, I, you know, that my effective response to that sector um, is, is why I haven't done more work on food, Harriet. <laughs> um, I, I have a, like, it's just, it's just, it is so brutally hard to look at that industry, not just the livestock industry, the whole thing and the labor side of it, as well as the, the non-human side of it. Um, so this is a huge part of my work and a lot of my work, I find like, I'm kind of like, you know, I go, I've been working on militaries and, and corporate violence and, you know, colonialism and racial capitalism for a long time, but I'm carried by all the otherwise work, you know, all the work of that I think you flagged nicely in the opening, um, which is not just like possibility, but actually existing lives, you know, that are, you know, kin networks of mine, of, of people that I uh, value and, and, um, and grateful for on this planet who are fighting these struggles every day and creating all, all kinds of possibilities and, and all kinds of forms of survivance. Um, and so um, it, I guess my work, you know, is, is both propelled by some of the horrors, um, the real horrors, like some of the most gruesome thing, like even my work before logistics on um, military recruitment was equally, um, gruesome sometimes to, to work on, but I also um, then have this incredible um, gratitude uh, and, um, and feeling of responsibility um, to do some of that work as a white person, as a settler, as someone with all kinds of privilege, but who's also benefited from uh, the extraordinary uh, and visionary work of so many communities, especially communities of, of color that, that continue to build um, possibilities that um, create possibilities for all of us, not, you know, so 
Um, but the, I'm also very, and I didn't get into this today, but I'm also very, very shaped by queer politics. And, um, you know, we could think about Jose Munoz's, um, uh, you know, uh, questions of futurity, queer futurity, the, all the kinds of investments um, that I grew up with, you know, that were my, my, some of my political formation um, around the simultaneous need for desire, pleasure, sex, and sexuality, um, and struggle, right? The, the, these were um, really important lessons for me as a young person, uh, and I've never left. So I, I feel like um, that combination, I guess, um, trying to hopefully be very, uh, bring a lot of humility to the work, um, uh, knowing the kind of scale of the gruesome that we're dealing with, but also um, humility in, in the sense of um, the respect and gratitude for um, the inspiring work as well. I don't know what to say about great migrations beyond that, but maybe we can someday meet up for, for a dinner or, or drink and talk more. Thanks. That was absolutely wonderful. We have two minutes left, Deb. I welcome you to provide any other concluding remarks. If not, um, we can end it there. Oh, I think I've talked a lot, so I'll just say thank you so much. And, yeah. um, and thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks for organizing it. And I look forward to the other installments in the series. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. Thank you again to Professor Deborah Cowan, who gave a really wonderful talk. Uh, we hope to see you again soon. So be well. Take care.